Now, the Euro crisis uh, has sort of receded uh, in the news. Uh, it isn't talked about as much. And you might be forgiven for thinking that its effects have worn off, it's over. But no, Greece is still under capital control and there are still one in five unemployed in Greece and Spain. And so given how important this topic is, we're really, really delighted to be uh, welcoming such an excellent group of panelists today who are going to be talking about where we move forward uh, on this vital issue. So first up, uh, we have Walter Denhan. So he's a professor of economics at the LSE, having previously been in Amsterdam, and he's going to talk about the future of the euro. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for organizing this uh, event. Let me apologize for uh, showing that slide to you for so long. Um, here is the, uh, the slightly more informative title. Okay, so for the, in the interest of full disclosure, so I'm a macroeconomist from uh, one of the northern countries. You're gonna have two from the periphery countries and one from the UK, so you get a bit of a balanced view. But what, you're probably gonna hear lots of really bad things about the euro. And so what I wanna do in the couple of slides that I have, I sort of wanna go against it a little bit. Uh, so, I can get this. Ah, there you go. So <clears throat> where do we start and where do we end up, right? So all the bad stuff about the euro crisis you see over here on the right side. So over here is that we've got time on the x-axis, we've got sovereign debt spreads on the vertical axis, and you see this is all the mess that we got ourselves into. But before we had the euro, we had sort of a very similar kind of mess. And so then we said, well, you know, it's just that what we have now is not really fixed exchange rate, it's that we had to, uh, currency risk, depreciation risk, and monetary policy was a problem, and they said, well, now we need something else, and so they left the euro. And now we have the euro, and we say, well, you know, there's all these problems, monetary policy is a problem. And so, <coughs> I wanna ask whether it's really, you know, would, would life really have been a lot better if we would not have had the, uh, the euro? So, in particular, would we not have had a, you know, a crisis in the, in the euro area? Uh, well, I'm pretty sure we still would have had a crisis. I mean, they all started out you know, as a financial crisis. European banks, they would have suffered. It's possible that they would have been a little bit less, uh, but I'm not even sure about that. Um, government finances got into troubles because of the banks, and I think because of the financial crisis, banks would have been in trouble anyway, and so I think governments would have been in trouble anyway. It's possible that structural imbalances within Europe would not have been so problematic. Right? This is that, so the, the FANG countries, they saved a lot, but FANG is like Finland, Austria, the Netherlands, and Germany, and then Gypsies, most people know. Um, it's, it's true, is it, that the Euro you know, created some kind of sort of overconfidence that sort of made these things possible, but we have lots of, uh, we've seen lots of bubbles is that, you know, when the countries were not in the currency union, and, um, so I'm, I'm not sure where the euro really made things that much worse. Maybe it's uh, self-fulfilling uh, bad outcomes more likely. And then actually, uh, Joe Carlo has written a really nice paper on that sort of argument is that now it's even if uh, you yeah, have yeah, a currency union is that you can still have this uh, self-fulfilling, you know, expect expect oh sorry, I'm saying it right. Even if you have your own monetary independent policies is that you still have these uh, possibilities of self-fulfilling bad outcomes. Right? A lot of people that say is, is that we see in so like Greece and Spain and Italy is, is that, is that the market gets uh, worried about the future, then they start ha asking higher uh, risk premium on the debt and then it becomes tougher for the government to pay those and then so that that's would be the bad equilibrium. But that you can also have if you have your, your own independent uh, monetary policy. Okay. So, <coughs> I think we would have been in a you know, severe crisis anyway. So now the question is, is that would countries have had you know, many more tools to sort of fight the crisis if there would not have been uh, a euro? And you, you, you often hear that, right? And so the argument you often hear made is, is that, well, if you're not in a currency union, you can depreciate your uh, currency and then you know, your exports become cheaper and it's, uh, it's much easier to get out of the crisis. Now the thing is, 
And so one of the big puzzles in international economics is that we don't really understand very well is, is that why exports and imports actually don't respond at the aggregate level so much to depreciation. It happens sometimes, but very often it doesn't. Right? Is that so when you get it you have this world where you have flexible exchange rate, right? Or at least not completely fixed exchange rate. Then we say, well, there's all these puzzles. Is that the world doesn't respond the way they should, according to our theory, and we need something else. And so then we don't go to a new system, like a currency union, and then that doesn't work the way we want. And we say, well, you know, it's all bad, and we want something else. <coughs> um, right? But so, <coughs> I mean, there isn't there isn't sort of you know perfect world, and um, all these adjustment mechanisms that you know we think are there according to our theory, in practice, they uh, they, they often don't work. Like for example, the UK, right, the, the pound depreciated quite a bit at the beginning of the financial crisis, but you didn't really see is, is that British exports uh, re really taken off. The other thing I think that people forget is that <coughs> if you have a depreciating currency and you are a country like Spain that is and exporting but also importing, and then that actually could be quite problematic. And the other thing is, is that often people think, well, if uh, countries uh, had their own monetary policy, then they could have you know, uh, inflated uh, the debt away. But again, is, is that it's not clear that you know, a lot of these countries that are now in trouble would have been able to issue debt in their own currency. Um, and if they would not have been able to issue debt in their own currency, then the problems even could have been bigger. Um, and then so then, you know, the last comment about this slide is, is that so people often think that you know, if you own monetary policy, then government debt is never a problem because you can always sort of you know, inflate it away. Uh, but inflation is you know, it's like default. It's like a partial default. Moreover, inflation is default on all debt, not just government debt. Right? And again, is that not clear that that's really better than sort of, you know, the actual bailouts and defaults that, that we've, uh, we've seen now. Okay, and the other thing is kind of an obvious comment that you shouldn't forget is, is that the euro has never been about just economics, is that there's you know, important political motivations too. And so that's how I'm going to end. <coughs> Thank you very much for that, Walter. Um, we're now going to move uh, to Ricardo Reis, uh, who is a professor of um, professor of economics at Columbia. He's currently on leave, and he's at the LSE right now. Um, he's the youngest ever professor in Columbia's history, um, and so we're really proud. To, um, we're really happy to be welcoming here, uh, sir. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. I've actually. So thank you for coming. Um, I've actually been spending quite a bit of time in Cambridge in the last couple of months, but I am visiting the LSE for the year. Um, so I was out, Vivek emailed me and said, can you please come and talk a little about the future of the euro slash bar, will the euro survive? So let me answer those questions, starting with the, from the easy one to the hard one. So the first one, will the euro survive? Will there be a euro by the end of 2006? I'm pretty confident the answer is yes. Euro has been hit by quite a few shocks. It has reacted to them in the sense of the ECB and the Euro system. But it doesn't seem, if anything, that it's as close to the precipice as it was it two or three years ago. A much, a slightly harder question right away, so now that I took that out, I'm pretty confident saying there will be a Euro in the European Central Bank by the end of this year. Slightly harder question is, will Greece be in the Euro by the end of the year? I'm much less sure about that. Euro the Greece is still effectively out of the euro insofar as it has capital controls. It is still the case that we seem to think, at least in the euro, in the euro system, that if we allowed Greeks to take out euros and put them under their mattress, they would all run and do so, which is nothing else but the entire Greek population telling us that they don't think they're going to be in the euro by the end of the year. And as a result, they'd rather have foreign currency under their mattress than domestic currency in their bank. So at least according to the Greeks, no, they're not going to be there. Um, that may change or that may not change. <coughs> the future of the euro, though, and whether the, whether the euro survives, ends up being tied, though, more and then now getting harder, is to uh, whether the ECB, the European Central Bank, the euro system, can survive in their current shape. And there I'm getting more confident on the other direction, which is it cannot survive in the sense that the ECB has to change 
in its institutions, the ECB has to change in terms of what it's able or not to do. But in big reason, instead of criticizing the ECB, I will rather say that it has to change, it is Europe that has to change relative to the ECB, because over the last five years, we have pushed a lot on the ECB. The ECB has done a lot more than what it is supposed to do, than what it should have done, perhaps, in a world in which the rest of Europe should have chipped in. The ECB has been the only European economic institution to have a coherent speech over the last five years, unlike the Troika or the summit to summit changes in political balances between whether the German or the French view or someone else's view changed. And a big problem for why this recession has been so bad and the Euro crisis has been so difficult has been a tremendous amount of policy and political uncertainty. Since investors do not know whether from the next summit we're going to have that all the bondholders lose or maybe it's all the depositors or something else, and we keep on improvising every three months. Why? Because we don't have an ECB counterpart when it comes to fiscal policy, when it comes to financial policy. As a result, the ECB has had to be the only one who's coherent in the room, and that's a hard position to be in. Second, the ECB has been the only one that has provided consistent stimulus in the sense of realize that given that output seems to be so low, low interest rates, quantitative easing, or whatever other tools of monetary policy can be used to try to offset, partly at least offset, this recession. On the fiscal side, we've had some countries doing austerity, some doing expansion, some doing more than they should have, in both directions, both too much austerity and too little austerity at the same time. And as a result, the overall fiscal balance in the euro, in the euro area has been for the most part incoherent, inconsistent, and as a result has not provided any of the economic stimulus that may have been necessary or not. Third, the ECB over the last six months has even become a creator of financial markets, something that financial policy should be doing and financial institutions and governments should be doing. The ECB in its latest round of quantitative easing said, well, we want to really start buying this particular type of corporate bonds. Why? We'd like to start up a market in corporate bonds in Europe, but unfortunately, <coughs> European firms borrow too much from banks instead of issuing bonds. Central banks shouldn't be trying to start a corporate bond market in Europe. Financial institutions should be doing it. Financial regulators should be doing it. Governments, that's what we pay ministers of finance to do and heads of the treasury to do. Fourth, the ECB has been far too often thrown into the role of the guy who should observe the losses. We have a ton of, still quite a few countries as well as banks that have a lot of legacy debt. They're just swimming in debt that they're not going to be able to pay. And, it all, and every six months comes that another proposal to say, well, why don't we just unload the losses on the ECB and let them deal with us? The Greek event in February being the more recent one. And to, in its credit, the ECB resisted very well in saying that you should dump the losses of Greece in it. But they come every six months, every three months, because there's losses out there. And the Portuguese taxpayer and the Spanish taxpayer and the Italian taxpayer and the German taxpayer and the Austrian taxpayer doesn't want to admit that they're going to be the ones paying for it. And so we've been playing this game of chicken where everyone agrees, well, we could just dump it on the ECB and have the ECB suffer the losses and just send us a smaller senior check for the next 30 years. And wouldn't that be lovely because none, no one in our electorate would notice. Well, but the ECB shouldn't be doing this. And using the ECB's balance sheet or central bank's balance sheet to cover for losses that you don't want to admit to your public is the beginning of every hyperinflation in the world. It's exactly when you try to use the inflation tax instead of using other taxes to pay for losses. The most, to conclude though, the, uh, not to conclude, the, beyond all of those though, there is one missing institution, there is one missing instrument that has been, that is urgent to create and that has been missing throughout the Euro crisis and that continues to be urgent to create it is a big part of why we had a crisis in the first place, of why it became so deep, and it will be a big part of why we'll have a crisis again in six months or a year, in which case maybe the euro will not survive or not. And that is the fact that we created a monetary institution, a common monetary institution. I've already told you about the problems of not having a fiscal or financial or some other commonality or at least a coherent policy. But more importantly is that right now the financial architecture of the euro area has never had something that has proven to be important for every other monetary union that I know of in history, and that is to have a common bond or a common safe asset. It is very hard for a central bank to engage in its actions if it cannot resort to exchanging its reserves that it issues for a euro-wide safe asset. This is the bare bones of how monetary transmission works. It is very hard for you to engage in financial regulation when you can't tell banks that in bad or good times they should hold more of the safe or less of the safe asset. 
which unfortunately you cannot do in Europe right now because there's no such thing as a European safe asset. And if you go and tell the Greek banks they should hold more German bonds, that ends up having a lot of international capital flow implications that can be even more damaging than the, than the requirement of safety. It is very difficult, again, to imagine a Europe going forward in terms of effective monetary policy, in terms of effective financial regulation, and in terms of the banking union that is desired without there being some form of a European safe asset. And it is not the case that a European safe asset requires a euro bond. It is not the case that we all now have to issue bonds and Germans and, and Spanish have to stand by, by, by side solidary responsible for their payments so that the Germans will, with good reason, suspect that the Spanish will eventually down the line not pay and so the German will have to foot the whole bill. We can create safe assets. We can create safe assets in other ways by issuing bonds, say, by European investment banks. We can issue, I proposed a few years ago, the so-called European safe bond, which would be nothing but pooling the bonds of different uh, issued already by the different European states and governments. Given that diversified pool, engage in what's sometimes called financial engineering tranching, that is, have a senior and a junior tranche, which means that the payments from the Greek bonds and the Portuguese bonds and the German bonds would first lead to pay the senior tranche and only then the junior component of this portfolio of bonds. The senior tranche would be a safe bond and that would be extremely safe. It is one that the ECB can buy without without leading to capital flows across borders. It is one that we can tell banks to hold. And in doing so, we can create right away a much deeper financial integration that avoids actually some of the problems that, that uh, occurred with the monetary union. So now to conclude, I will disagree actually slightly with Wouter, but then we'll, or not slightly, I'll disagree with Wouter, and, but then we'll get to the discussion. And that actually, because we, we had a euro, but we did not have a European safe asset, that explains quite a bit of why we had a recession. And if we perhaps had no euro and no euro safe asset, but I would even say even better, if we had a euro and a European safe asset, we would not have had such a bad crisis and we would have certainly have dealt with it much clearly. And this is something that we can do and can implement relatively quickly and easily. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Uh, we're now going to be um, listening to Angus Armstrong, Dr. Angus Armstrong. Uh, who is currently Director of Macroeconomics at the NIESR, uh, which is the uh, UK's oldest think tank. And before that, she was Head of Macroeconomic Analysis at the Treasury during the financial crisis. So we're very privileged to be welcoming here today. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And it's a tremendous pleasure uh, to be speaking uh, to this society. Uh, I think that when we consider the future of the euro, one really does need to take a pluralist approach, look more than beyond just economics, because it's never just been about economics. And perhaps I can start by just mentioning the previous monetary unions we've had on this continent. The Latin monetary union, it sounds like it should be in South America, but it was actually Italy and Spain and so on. The Latin monetary union in the 19th century, that was uh, very successful for a while, but failed. Uh, we then had the Austro-Hungarian Austro Monetary Union. Uh, that was beginning of the 19th century. Uh, that also, so beginning of the 20th century, that also failed. And now I've got the European Monetary Union. And of course, when this was created, it was quite fun. I mean, I, I'm sort of um, old enough to remember when it was created that many American economists said this is a disaster. That you really shouldn't do this. It's going to end in a terrible mess. And many Europeans said, oh, that's typical. Sour grapes, you just want to keep your dollar. Well, um, unfortunately, I would argue that based where we've got to so far, they were probably right. I think it's in important to think about why the euro was created. Um, first of all, the, uh, the creation of the whole European project owes a lot to militarism uh, in the Suez Crisis when the British and French went down to invade Egypt and say, we're going to have the Suez Canal, thank you very much. And it wasn't until the Americans turned around and said, no, you're not. And the British, of course, at this point, said, well, what on earth are you doing? And they said, you will never be powerful enough to make these sort of controls again. And at this point, many of the <coughs> European leaders got together and said, we need to do something. We need to club together. And that was one of the main reasons at the start of this powerful bloc called Europe. So the idea uh, of creating a single currency, first of all, the single currency, the idea was that it would lead to greater social cohesion across Europe. 
perhaps reduce transaction costs a bit, but give more of a sense of identity of being European. Most people accept that the gains from trade would be quite small because we already had fixed exchange rates across continental Europe. So if that was the idea, to get some sort of cohesion and perhaps a little bit of productivity, a little bit of uh, economic efficiency, has the euro been a success? And contrary to my good friend Wouter, I think the answer to this is uh, probably not. I think that um, Germany, instead of expanding into uh, southern Europe, has expanded more into eastern Europe. Uh, when we look at the sort of unemployment rates across the Union, the imbalances, the current accounts, I think it's very hard to see that actually uh, this is really what people had in mind when they created this single currency. The, um, uh, the, the crisis, I accept, would have happened whatever currency you had, but the problem with having the single currency and the lack of uh, a so-called safe asset has meant that our means of adjustment has been much, much smaller, and so it's probably made it deeper rather than uh, easier to adjust. So if uh, one accepts the view that the euro has actually not been a success, then the question is, can we actually make it into success before we have to do something else? And this is kind of the unthinkable, but, you know, that's what these forums are for. So one approach is the sort of current approach. Just keep waiting, and the price mechanism will eventually work, and the Greeks and people from the southern European countries will take enough pay cuts, they will eventually become competitive, and everything will be all right. That's one approach. And people look to the US for this and say, look, that's what states do in America. They all adjust. And in fact, what tends to happen is much more you get depopulation out of certain regions. The adjustment's much more difficult than people think. And just have to look at today in, Chicago, in um, Michigan, in Detroit, where they're going through uh, a financial crisis. You know they're having to go as far as selling, really, the, the, state's, uh, the state's special assets, uh, the Diego Rivera mural, which is the tragedy it's being sold out of, out of, um, out of Michigan. So that's one approach. I think that we don't have that much time to wait. Uh, politics is moving. The rise of the right in some of these countries is moving. Another, if you look at the technocrats, what do they suggest? Well, they give ideas like risk-sharing mechanisms. Terrific. Makes total sense. We should have done it before. Banking union. Very good. Capital markets union. But, you know, are these really capturing the imagination of the public? Is that really going to do it? And that's where I struggle a bit. And when we think about our own country, the United Kingdom, we have a very odd country. You know, I'm from Newcastle, and the level of output per head in Newcastle is half of what it is in London. But, and I live in London. So I have, but I have no problem, I don't even give a second thought to fiscal transfers up to the Northeast, because we are a political union. 40% of our economy is, is controlled by the, the government. In Europe, the European budget is 1% of GDP. In other words, you've got a euro, you've got a currency, almost without a government. And that, I think, is the difficult thing. It's very hard to sustain. And I th in order for this thing to uh, be sustainable, I think we have to have pol enough political support and really imaginative ways to think about making transfers as well as the insur these insurance mechanisms to the regions throughout Europe, which creates some, requires some really innovative thinking about what does regional policy really mean? And economists have typically shied away from this. How, in today's world, do we do effective regional policy? I think that is going to be the central part if the euro is to survive, which, um, uh, quite frankly, I think is still an open question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angus. Um, we're now going to be moving on to our final speaker, um, Cambridge's very own uh, Professor Giancarlo Corsetti, who is um, a professor of macroeconomics at the faculty. Um, and he's uh, also co-editor um, co of the Journal of International Economics. So uh, could you please welcome Giancarlo Corsetti. So let me <coughs> start with a Yogi Berra moment. Uh, Yogi Berra was the last late Yogi Berra, just the best book player 
who say many things. And one of the things he says is that you can observe a lot just by watching. So in a Yogi Bear moment, if you observe the world now, you see something very specific and very clear. Countries, regions with institutions, politics, where despite conflicts, there is a high degree of exchange, they are much better than Europe, where institutions and politics and a high degree of conflicts has a low degree of shame. So this risk, this crisis has been about an explosion of uncertainty and risk. Countries that manage to deal with risk, that you know, have been dealing with the risk, are now you know, lower employment, poor employment. Europe is the opposite. Now, this begs the next question, which is, what is the opposite of resharing? And the opposite of resharing in a model that we teach in class is actually very nice, but it really is something different. The opposite of resharing is the creation of endogenous risk, is the creation of liquidity risk, is the creation of a useless dissipation of capital because firms, households cannot keep doing what they do because they are in trouble financially. If you look at the history of the euro, this is like I, I'm pushing a little bit something that Ricardo said, and I agree with it. I agree completely with it. If Europe had a little bit more of a mechanism of resharing in the form of a safe asset, it would have been much, much better. What you had in Europe in 2010 is the fact that, you know, for a stupid country like Greece to be in trouble, we let the risk premium genie out of the bottle in Europe. Everything became risk, risky. Uh, we had the, a solar risk crisis, which has no precedent and no power there of this side. So when you have a solar risk crisis, it's not that the government of Italy or Spain is in trouble. When you have a solar risk crisis, well, actually, it is a mislabel. We shouldn't talk about an explosion of companies. <coughs> Everybody working in Europe, in Italy, Spain, and other countries partake, partook, or basically had to face the same financial difficulties that uh, was were uh, uh, putting the the, uh, the the soil. So endogenous risk is what costed us 10, 15, uh, depending on you calculate, 10 percentage point of of uh, uh, GDP. If you, my, my favorite graph was a student in Cambridge, which was shown very early on. This graph everybody has done it, but he was the first one to do it. But if you, if you look at the GDP of the UK in 2008, Q1, and you put it together with Italy, they moved together completely until 2011. 2011, they go apart. Italy falls right to, 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 the, to the UK, 10 percentage point. Now, what is endogenous risk? Endogenous risk is the fact that uh, we started a monetary union without the institutions that are required to build the monetary union, to, to make the monetary union sus sustainable, to make the monetary union deliver what it was created for, which I remind you, not only the generic uh, prosperity, but it was also created as a way to lock countries in Europe into a uh, non-conflict to all hmm? development. So in a way, this is a little bit a paradox. You know? the, and, and remember, there are many reasons to a conflict in Europe or, uh, uh, at this point. So the, the fact that the euro after them is not. Uh, so um, um, I, don't, I don't have much time to, to, to go one direction or another. But I just want to, 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 to say that the, it was a big mistake to let the uh, solar risk crisis to go the way it went. It took a long time to convince the most skeptical observers in Germany and other places that the ECB should have been involved in containing the solar risk. This happened only when Draghi had the famous speech, uh, whatever it takes, but especially with the OMT's program, which, oh, surprise, he, he, he established that ECB can buy government bond. Wow. Now this central bank can buy or not. What, what a principle. And you know, in this country, the Bank of England bought one fourth of the yield. Nobody knows. So you do it, you don't say. Right? In Europe, we had to debate that for two years. 
And then at the end, uh, we had to devise something that is wonderful. Only Draghi could think of something actually was studied in the Bank of England. We do it without, uh, actually, we say without doing it, because MT is basically a program whose success is exactly, rests exactly on the fact that it's not actually called for. Uh, there are no, no, it's, it's the threat of the chase that, you know, the actual procedure. So uh, let me skip. You, you, I, I do like Stiglitz. I went to see Stiglitz. Stiglitz usually when he starts to show books that he wrote. I don't buy books. <laughs> I have a chapter in books. So this is like a chapter in book. <laughs> you can have uh, CPR. We all have CPR members. We, we buy a lot of these books. So this you can get the explanation of this idea of the endogenous risk. I want to say two things. First, endogenous risk is again with us today as we speak. Because from the 1st of January, there's something called the Bailey's Directive. That basically create a, an obligation for states not to put any money in a bank that fails and put all the uh, uh, losses on, a, on, the, on the investors in the bank with an hierarchy of different instruments. You, you have read about Portugal, you have read Now, this is a wonderful institution unless you use it on the principle that you need to pay. You know, it's not it's like it's economics. You know, economics is like the dentist. You don't want a moral dentist that tortures you because you did something wrong in the past. You want a dentist that fix your, your tooth. So this attitude of you need to pay is not definitely not uh, healthy, which is exactly what's going on now. And uh, the second part of it is that uh, it's a little bit like austerity too, the revenge. You know, at the end of the day, austerity was the idea that you could not use the instrument in the right direction. You need to pay. Okay? Now, again, the bailout is steady doing the sense. You cannot use your instrument to guarantee financial stability. You need to pay. This is a dangerous thing, a dangerous for you, it's dangerous for the world, because this is dragging down the world global cycle again. I don't have the time, but I think, you know, it is, it is a situation in which Europeans should they have all the pain that it takes to wake up and say, hey, wait a second, we have a monetary union, right? It's like, you know, you are buying and say, hey, wait a second, I don't have the steering wheel, I don't have the saddle. That's why it's painful. But I mean, the point is, you need to have the saddle and the steering wheel in a, in a, in a bank. And what are the saddle and the steering wheel in, in a monetary union? Are a safe asset. Second, a way to guarantee the right macroeconomic stance in, the, in Europe. So something to say, demand is too low, we need to increase demand. It cannot be done by the ECB alone, it needs to be done by the fiscal authorities. And third, unfortunately, something that takes care of the legacy debt, and yes, what is called an orderly procedure of the fall. The reason why we need an orderly procedure of the fall because with the debt we have and all the accumulation of uh, losses after seven years of deep recession, there will be some episodes, right? And what we don't want from episode default, again, the ignition of endogenous risk. The fall must be taken care of, having in mind that we need to avoid that the fall becomes a prejudice from the integrity of the euro, that the fall becomes uh, the same thing as exit, that the fall becomes the same thing of endless discussion. For, so we need a way of an agreement how to deal with the fall in a way that... Uh, so this is very easy to say, very difficult to do. Uh, I think people should read what uh, Ricardo wrote a long time ago, this SBEs and, and various forms of... Uh, of uh, of, uh, so all this is basically what I'm saying is that with a little bit of political will, we don't need a big treaty reform. The, all this thing I'm saying can be done just by implementing wisely what is already in the past. Maybe we can come back in, in the second. I will be the